Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Simon Ritter, who will talk about his lessons learned with lambdas and streams in JDK 8. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, and good morning. I'm glad to see that uh, there's a lot of people in the audience. It's nine o'clock. I know it's an early start, but I'm glad to see there's, there's plenty of people come to learn about lambdas and streams. So let's start with a quick show of hands. Who here is using JDK 8? Okay, reasonable number of people. Who here has at least tried JDK 8? Okay, most people, good. So what I'm going to do with this particular session is to talk about lambdas and streams in JDK 8. But rather than talking about it simply from the point of view of these are the features, this is how they work, and the usual sort of thing that you might get in terms of an introduction. What I want to do with this is more helping you to understand some of the things that you can not do with lambdas and streams. And so I called it lessons learned because I have learned a number of things as I've been using lambdas and streams in JDK 8. And in fact, there's a, there's a lovely phrase that I found quite a while ago, and I think it's very sort of relevant to this particular presentation. And it says that a clever man learns from his mistakes. A wise man learns from other people's. So I'm going to be clever. You are going to be wise. You are going to learn from my mistakes. Now, obviously, most people here have already used JDK 8 and are using JDK 8. So we'll, we'll kind of spend a few minutes at the beginning just talking about the basics of lambdas and streams, just to recap on what they are and some of the features, because it's quite important to understand some of the details as we move into the rest of the presentation. So first part then, what are we talking about with Lambda expressions? Now, this is the kind of code that we would see very typically when we program before JDK 8. We want to create some new thread, and we want to execute something in that thread. Now, we could take the runnable interface, and we could create a new class. We'd implement runnable. We could have the run method. We could put whatever we want to do in that run method. And then we can create a new thread, and we can pass in a new instance of that class. Great. But in JDK 1.1, we introduced the idea of anonymous inner classes. In fact, inner classes. So we don't actually have to create an explicit new class. We can do it this way. We can say, OK, create a new runnable, and let the compiler generate the class for us. And then we'll say what we want to do, which is do some stuff. That's OK, because it makes our life a little bit easier. But the problem with this is it's really kind of clunky from a syntax point of view. So we actually have to say that we want a new runnable. So we're saying what the type of the thing is that we're creating. We have to put braces in there. We have to explicitly state that we want a run method, which takes no parameters, returns a void, is public, more braces. All of that just to put in one line, which is do some stuff. So Lambda expressions is really about simplifying this type of code. And now what we can do is we can use the Lambda expression operator, an arrow. And believe me, there was a lot of discussion about what that operator was going to be. And in fact, there was massive discussion about whether it should be a minus and a greater than or an equals and a greater than. So what, what type of arrow is going to be used? So now we have a simpler way of doing this. The Lambda expression is, in effect, an implementation of that method, the run method. So we take no parameters, so we have empty brackets on the left-hand side of the operator. And then the right-hand side of the operator is the body of that method. So it gives us an implementation of the abstract method, which is in the runnable interface. Great. Now, we can use a Lambda expression wherever the type of what we're using is a functional interface. So let's just recap about what a functional interface is. So the first thing about a functional interface is it has to be an interface. Now, that might seem pretty obvious, but when you also know that it has to have one abstract method, some people will say, oh, can't I use an abstract class and have one abstract method in there? And the answer is no, it has to be an interface. The thing about a functional interface is that it has only one abstract method. 
And if you look back in Java SE 7 and earlier, it was very easy to spot places where you could, in JDK 8, use a functional interface, because it only had one method. Runnable has one method, run. Comparator has one method, compare. So there's lots of examples where you can use this in code from Java SE 7 and earlier. But in JDK 8, it's a little harder to spot functional interfaces, because there were two things that were introduced in JDK 8, as well as Lambda expressions, that make life a little bit more interesting. So one of these was the idea of default methods. This was so that you could extend an existing interface without breaking backwards compatibility. If you add a method to an interface, now what you can do is you can say, if the implementation that I have doesn't have that particular method in it, the compiler can go back to the interface and find an implementation in there. So that, that changes things in terms of Java because it introduces multiple inheritance of behavior as well as multiple inheritance of types. The other thing that was introduced in JDK 8, because we now have behavior in an interface, is support for static methods in an interface. So you quite often find that a functional interface can have multiple methods, but only one of them must be abstract. And the Lambda expression gives you the implementation of that abstract method. If you want to write your own functional interface, you can do that. You can use the annotation functional interface, and the compiler will check for you that you do only have one abstract method. Lambda expressions are used a lot in streams. So what are streams? You can think of a stream as being like a pipeline of operations. So you want to process data through this pipeline. At one end of the pipeline, you have your stream source, where you're going to get the elements from that you're going to process. You take that stream, and you pass it through zero or more intermediate operations. Intermediate operation is one that takes as input a stream and generates as output a stream. That way, you can feed the output from one intermediate operation to the input of another. You can chain them together. We'll see examples of this. Once you've got to the end of that pipeline and you want to generate some sort of result, you need a terminal operation. That takes as input a stream, but doesn't generate a stream as output. It can generate explicit results in the form of a collection, in the form of a, a single result, or it may just have some kind of side effect. It may just print a message, for example. Here's an example, simple one. So what we're doing here is we're saying, OK, I've got a set of transactions. I'm going to take those transactions and create a stream from it. That generates a stream of elements. We pass that into an intermediate operation, which is to filter it. We use a lambda expression to represent the predicate that we're going to use to determine which elements from that stream we're going to pass on. And in this case, we want to only get the buyers where the city that they were in was London. We pass that stream of elements into another intermediate operation where we map it from the actual transactions into the prices of those transactions. Again, we use a lambda expression, but using a shorthand version, a method reference, to say that we want to get the price from the transaction. We pass that stream into a terminal operation, sum, add them all up, generate a result. So this is the, the form of a stream. And in terms of explaining how it works, it's very easy to think of it in those terms. One stream is being passed into a method, another stream comes out of an, the method, and so on. But actually, that's not quite the way it works underneath. What actually happens is it's only when you get to the terminal operation that things actually happen. And this is quite important, as we'll see as we go through and talk about some of the parallel operations on streams. So what happens is that when you get to the terminal operation, the terminal operation will figure out what needs to be done. And it will compress or coalesce all of the operations that are in this stream into one set of operations. And that way, it can optimize things so that you only pull results or values through the stream as you need them. You can do lazy evaluation. You can do short circuiting. There's various optimizations that can take place underneath because of the way that the stream system understands the values that are coming through. It has a way of actually identifying um, things about the stream, so whether it's distinct, whether it's sorted, all those types of things. So this is the basics of lambdas and streams. 
Let's have a look at how we can use these things to improve our code. Now, the first thing to look at is delayed execution. So here's something that we might see quite a lot in our code. Now, I'm assuming that you're using the, the standard logging API rather than log4j or something else. But this is a, a good example. This is where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle applies to software. Now, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, if you've done physics, is all about the fact that the act of observing something changes what you're observing. And it applies just as well to computer science as it does to quantum physics. Here's a good example. We're going to call logger.finest. And what we're going to do is we're going to generate a message that we might want to log. So we call this method get some status data. That's all well and good. We, we know how this works. We understand the concept of it. We're passing a value to logger.finest. The value is generated by this method. But there's a problem with this, which is that if we set the logging level to info, for example, we're going to have a significant performance impact. If our method gets some status data, takes a long time to generate that message, we're going to go off, generate message, take all that time, and then pass the value to logger.finest. But the problem with that is that when we get to logger.finest, the logger is going to say, right, what level are we at? If we're at level info, it just returns. Doesn't need the message, doesn't have to do anything. But we've still had to call that method in order to pass the result to logger.finest. So we can use Lambda expressions to simplify this. We can use Lambda expressions to improve the efficiency of it. And what we can do is we can use a functional interface, which is called supplier. And what supplier does is, as the name would suggest, it supplies a result. It's a method which doesn't take any parameters, so you don't pass anything into it, but you get back a result from it. And all of the logging methods in the, the standard logging API have been modified so that there's a new version of these methods which takes a supplier as an argument. So we can change very subtly our code here. So rather than just passing the result of get some status data to logger.finest, we can change that to use a Lambda expression. So all we're doing is adding a few characters. But now we're using a Lambda expression to tell the logger.finest how to produce that message, not the actual message. And that, that's the important thing here, is we're actually passing a description of how to create the message. This is passing behavior as a parameter rather than a value. That way, we don't have to call get some status data in order to pass the message. We pass the Lambda expression. And then when we get to logger.finest, logger.finest will say, OK, what level are we at? If it's an info, we just return. But we've never called get some status data. If we're at logger.finest level, then it says, oh, OK, we need that message. So it uses the supplier, calls the method on that, which is implemented by a Lambda expression, calls get some status data, gets the message back, and then logs it. So we can eliminate the problem of having this overhead every time that we need to call this method. So we're not passing the message directly. And the important thing about this is that, OK, this is used in the logger API, but we can also use it in anything where we have code where, in effect, we're conditionally using the value that's being passed. If we don't know if we actually need that value until we get into the method, we can use a Lambda expression with the supplier to tell the method how to generate that result rather than actually passing the result. So the next thing that I want to talk about is avoiding loops in streams. So another question for a show of hands, who here would consider themselves a functional programmer? Good. That's what I like to see. Very few people put their hands up. And this is, this is a very good point, because I know from being a, a Java programmer for many years that I'm not a functional programmer. I remember at university I did one course on Lisp, and I struggled with that. And I, at the end of the course, I remember thinking to myself, my brain doesn't work that way. So I'll stick with procedural programming. I'll stick with imperative programming, because my brain works that way. 
So when we look at functional programming in Java using streams and Lambda expressions, we have to think differently. It's kind of like making the switch from C, where you're doing procedural programming, into Java, where you're doing object-oriented programming. A little bit of mind shift about how you're doing it. And the thing is that, as a Java programmer, we are very used to certain ways of doing things. We use loops in our code. For loops, while loops, do loops, all the time. Very logical, very sensible way of doing things in our code. We also really like variables, don't we? Because they're very useful for storing state. But if you look at functional programming, and the way that you're supposed to use functional programming, it's all about not modifying state. You're supposed to be able to call a function as many times as you like with the same value and get the same result. So there's no state involved in that function which might modify what you're getting out of the other side. But as programmers and Java programmers, state is really useful. We use it all the time, and we have to think a bit differently. So let's look at an example here. When I started using JDK when it first came out, I wanted a complete list of all the places where I could get a stream source from. I also wanted a complete list of all the methods in the Java APIs where I could use a Lambda expression. So all the methods that took a parameter, which was a functional interface. So I thought to myself, right, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to create that list because nobody else has. And in order to do that, I'm going to use lambdas and streams to do that. And so I wrote a couple of blog entries, which you'll, you'll still find on, I think it's still available on my Oracle blog, um, about how I did this. So I basically scanned all the API documentation, found all the classes which had a method that returned a stream, found all the methods that had a parameter that was a functional interface. And then I wanted to kind of summarize this information. So I thought, right, what I want to do is, in this case, I want to count all the methods that return a stream, so I know how many there are. And I thought, right, I'm going to be clever about this. So I had a hash map where the keys were the classes that had methods that return streams. And then the values associated with that were a set of methods that return streams. And so I thought, right, I want to count those up. So how can I do that? So I can take the hash map, and I can get from that the key set. So I'll get the key set, and then I can iterate over that using a stream. And for each of those classes, I can then count how many methods there are. Great. And so I did it this way. And I thought, right, so I'll use for each, because that's kind of key, because I said there I wouldn't do for each class. So I'll do that. For each seems to fit. And I'll use a Lambda expression, where I'm going to count how many methods there are. And I thought, right, so I'm not supposed to modify state, because that could interfere with parallel programming. But I know about this other class that was added in JDK, which is called a long adder. And a long adder is really designed for this type of situation, where you've potentially got multiple threads all updating the same variable. And they're doing frequent writes to that variable, but infrequent reads. So the way that it works is it says, OK, we'll give an instance of the variable to each of the threads so they can update it independently. There's no contention. There's no locking involved. They update their own copy of that variable because they're doing frequent writes. When a read is required, bring all those results together, deliver a single result. So I thought, great, I'll use a long adder. And so I, I did it this way, and I said, OK, for each of the elements in my key set, add up however many methods there are for each of those classes. And I thought, great, I've solved the problem. It works. Wonderful. And I showed it to one of the engineers at Oracle who was working on the streams side of things. And he said, ah, no, that's not functional programming. So I went away, and I thought, OK, let's have another go at it. I'll try it again. And I thought about it, and I said, OK, this time I'll use a map. And rather than doing for each, I'll say map from the class name to the number of methods that are associated with that class. So I simply return the number of methods associated with that class, pass that stream of values to sum, add them all up, and I get a result. So this is now functional programming. So it's rather than using for each, we use a map and sum, which is a form of reduce. OK, good. Then I had another piece of code, where what I wanted to do was I wanted to take the, the methods that would take 
a functional interface as a parameter. And I wanted to print out all of those. But I also wanted to count only the ones that were new in JDK 8. So now I'm trying to do two things at the same time. So my first approach was the same as I took with the first piece of code. So I used for each and had a slightly more complex lambda expression where I said, OK, we want to print out the actual method. And then we're going to see whether it's a new method. So test if it's new. If it is, increment our long adder. So I already know that this is wrong because it's not functional because we're modifying state. So I went away and I had another attempt at this. And I said, OK, let's try doing it this way. So rather than having a long adder where I've got state outside of the Lambda expression, I moved the state inside the Lambda expression. I thought, this is, this is OK. You know, I can do this in parallel without interfering with other threads. So what I did was I said, have a variable called new method, set it to 0, print out the method, and then test if it's a new method. If it is, set the variable to 1, and then just return whatever that variable is. So I get a stream of zeros and ones, as well as printing out the method. I can then pass that stream of zeros and ones into sum, add them all up, and get a count of the new methods. Show that to the engineer, and he said, no, no, no it's still not, still not functional programming, because you're still modifying state. Even though it's inside the Lambda expression, and it's, it's contained within that, it's still not functional programming. Problem with modifying state. So I thought, OK, right, have another go at this. See if I can get it really functional. So I thought, right, let's use another method in the Streams API, which is called peak. And peak is a nice little method, because all it does is take the input stream and pass it directly to the output stream. But it allows you to look at the values as they go past. And you can use it in this case if you just want to print out something. And that's very useful if you're trying to debug a stream, because you can see what values are going past as they're being processed. So in this case, I used it to print out the name of the method. And then I used map to int, but this time, no state involved. So what I said was, OK, just return using a tertiary operator whether the method is new or not, return 0 or 1. So I thought, great, now I have solved the problem. I'm, I'm now functional. And I showed it to the engineer again, and he said, well, actually, no. It's still not completely functional. I'm like, why? There's no state in there. He said, ah, problem is you've got a print statement in there. Print statement has a side effect. And in purely functional programming, there should be no side effects as well as no modification of state. So I looked at it and I went, OK, so you're telling me that I can't use a print statement because that has a side effect. And yet what I want to do is print something out. So isn't that kind of counterintuitive? I can't do what I want to do. So I said, OK, how do I do this? You know, how would I actually do this in a purely functional way? And he said, ah, what you need is an IO monad. And I'm like, OK, I'm good with this. Right, next thing I want to talk about is the art of reduction. And again, the need to think differently. So we've looked at the idea of not using a loop explicitly in our stream. Now let's think about how we use a reduction properly. When we rolled out JDK to Oracle, we ran a number of hands-on labs. So we gave people a number of exercises that they could solve in order to learn about Lambda expressions and the Streams API. One of the things that we set as a, an example was find the length of the longest line in a file. And we gave people a hint, which was that the buffered reader class has a new method in JDK 8, which allows you to return a stream of the lines associated with that reader. So if you create a buffered reader from a file, you can get the lines in that file. And the solution to this problem is actually fairly straightforward. Again, you're using a, a map to say, take your lines, map those lines into the length of the lines, then pass that to max and get the result. Now, max returns a thing called an optional, which is actually like an encapsulation of reference to an object. So you have to extract the value from the optional. So there's an extra line, get as int. So that was nice and simple. And we got people to do that, and that was good. But then somebody came along to me during one of these sessions, and they said to me, OK, how about if we change that problem a little? So you're telling us, find the length of the longest line in a file. How about if we change that, and we say, find the longest line in a file? 
And I thought to myself, hmm, OK, that, that's quite interesting. How would I do that? And so the next few slides are about how I kind of went through the process of learning about how to use a reduction. So my first attempt at this was what I call the naive stream solution. I thought, right, I want the longest line in the file. What I'll do is I'll sort the file by length. So I'll use a, a sort method. I'll use a lambda expression to say I want to sort by length, longest first. And then I'm going to pass that into a terminal operation, which is find first, which simply takes the first element of the stream and returns that. Great. So get the result of that, and that works. Job done. I've solved the problem. Well, no, not really, because if you think about it, a big file is going to take a long time to process. It's going to be a very inefficient way of doing this, because you have to sort the whole file, and then you only want one line from that file. So there must be a better approach to this. So I thought, OK, how do we do that? Now, the first thing I did was I thought, right, let's go back to being a Java programmer rather than a functional programmer and think about how we do it normally. And this is the kind of solution we come up with. We have a variable, longest, and we set it to be an empty string. And then we have a loop. So we say, while there are lines being read from the file, test to see whether the length of the line read from the file is longer than our current longest line. If it is, change that variable and move on. When we get to the end of the file, the value of longest is going to be the longest line in the file. So this is a very simple solution. It's like four lines of code, and we've solved our problem. So you think to yourself, OK, why do I need functional programming? This is good. It all works. The problem is that this is a very simple solution, but it is inherently serial. And as we see in a few minutes, when we talk about parallel operations, we can't make this into a set of parallel operations. The fact that we have a while loop means that we have a contract between us and the compiler about the order in which things are going to be processed. If we tried to split it up into parallel operations, we couldn't guarantee that order. And so we'd lose that contract. So it is inherently serial. Also, even if we took that loop away and we decided to try and break it up into multiple threads in another way, we still have some state. So we have mutable state, which means that it's not thread safe. Multiple threads of operation, we need locking, we'd have contention, various things that we need to deal with there. So what we need is a better approach. So then I thought to myself, OK, how do we do that? And how do we, how do we process something without using a variable to record the state? And this is a very good interview question to ask people. I know this because Google used it on me when I interviewed with them. How do you take a loop type operation and solve it without using an explicit variable? And the answer is recursion. So you can use recursion to, in effect, pass the state through the recursive calls and generate a result. So I thought, OK, let's, let's use recursion. Let's, let's solve the problem using recursion. So I wrote find longest string as a method. And basically, it takes a string that we have, which is our longest string so far, and the buffered reader where we want to get the next element from. We test to see whether the, the string is null that we've read from the the file, if it is, we just return back up through the call chain. And if it's not, we test to see whether the string that we have is longer than the, the longest we've got at the moment. And then we call the method recursively to go through all the lines in the file. If we want to use that, then we simply call find longest string. We pass in an empty string. We pass in our reader. And off we go. So then I thought, OK, great. So now no explicit loop, no mutable state. So in theory, we could do this in parallel. This is all good. So we've solved the problem. Hmm. Actually, no. Because obviously, if you have a large set of data, you're generating a stack frame for every line in the file. You're probably going to get an out of memory exception or stack overflow at some point once you get into large data sets. Too many stack frames. So what we need is a better stream solution. Now, if you look at the way streams work, they're essentially using the well-known map a filter map reduce pattern. Now, in this case, we don't need to do any filtering because we're not trying to eliminate elements from our stream. We don't need to do any mapping because all we're dealing with is the strings in our file. What we want to do is reduce all of those strings in the file into one string, which is the longest string in that file. So how do we do that? Well, 
If we look at the reduce method in the streams API, what we find is that the signature of that is that it returns an optional of type T. And it takes a single parameter, which is an accumulator. And the accumulator is of type binary operator. Binary operator is a functional interface. If we look at binary operator, what we find is it's a subclass of by function. By function is just a very simple idea of a function that takes two values and returns a single value. In the case of by function, the types can be different. Binary operator is simply type specific, so all of the types have to be the same. Both the parameters and the return type are all the same. Great, so now we know what the reduce method takes. What does it actually do? So what we need to do is find the right accumulator. And if you look at the documentation for the reduce method, it says that the accumulator takes a partial result and the next element and returns a new partial result. And that should seem very familiar, because if we think about the recursive approach that we had a couple of slides ago, that was effectively doing the same thing. So we're passing in a partial result, which is the longest string we've found so far. The ability to find the next element in the, in the file using the reader, and then generating a new partial result. But what we're doing here is doing the same thing, but rather than doing it recursively, we're doing it using a stream. So we're not having the overhead of all of those stack frames. And what we end up with is a better stream solution. So now we simply take our stream of lines and we pass it into the reduce method. We use a lambda expression to represent the accumulator. And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to pass x and y, which is the partial result that we have so far, and the next element in our stream. Test which is the longer of those two strings, and then return whichever is the longest of those two. That gives us a new partial result. So the key thing here is x, because what x does is it effectively maintains the state for us. We're not explicitly having state by defining a variable, what we're doing is we're saying, OK, x is the partial result which the stream will maintain for us and pass as we process elements along that stream. Once we've reduced all those streams into the single longest line, we get the result out and we have our result. So now we have a functional approach which doesn't use mutable state, it doesn't have a loop involved, so it can be made parallel without any issue. So I showed this to my, my favorite engineer, and he said, ah, oh, that's, that's very good. Yes, you've done very well. You've been through all this process. There is actually a much simpler way of doing this. You could actually just use the max method. So there's another form of the max method, which takes a comparator as a parameter. So rather than having to go through this whole reduce and everything, what you can simply do is pass the, a comparator, which in this case is comparing int, which is a, a static method on comparator and pass in the length of the string. So it will compare by length and give you the, the longest string as a result. But the important thing about this was, was to think about the, the learning process. Think about how you got from the idea of wanting to find the longest line in the string, in the file, and getting the result and, and using reduction. So now let's talk a little bit about parallel streams, because this is something which people see as a big feature in terms of streams. People think, ah, parallel streams. I can, I can make my code run faster. I can use parallel streams. And this tends to be the way that people approach streams. It's like, streams, great, new feature in Java. I will use streams for everything. So streams everywhere. And then I can do things in parallel. So let's use parallel streams everywhere. And we can get our results faster. So let's look at serial and parallel streams. Now, the thing is that Syntactically, it's very simple to switch between using a serial stream and a parallel stream. So if we take this simple example here, what we've got is a list of widgets. And we want to process that using filter map reduce. So we have our filter to get only the widgets that are red. We have a map to get the weight of the widgets, and then we pass it into sum. Great. When we call stream to get our stream source, that will generate a serial stream. Things will be processed sequentially, one after the other. If we want to turn that into a parallel set of operations, we can do that very easily. We simply change the way that we generate the stream. Now, 
we use parallel stream, and it will process things in parallel. That's a nice, simple thing to do. You know, so we, we don't have all this overhead of trying to think about threads and all sorts of things like that. We simply say, do it in parallel. Let the stream's code deal with that for us. Now, the only API that has an explicit parallel stream source is the collection interface. So if you're using a collection, you can generate a parallel stream by default. But if you're using any other stream source, that will only give you a sequential stream um, as a way of generating a stream source. That's not a problem, because you can actually switch between using serial and parallel using the serial or parallel method. So what you can do is you can say, OK, give me a parallel stream, and then we're going to filter that in parallel. Then we want to switch to serial, and then we'll pass that into map, so we'll, pass that, we'll process that serially. Then we're going to pass that to parallel, so we'll switch to a parallel stream, and then we'll do that as sum and do it in parallel. So you think, ooh, OK, that's, that's kind of interesting. But it actually isn't the way that it works. Because if you remember what I said earlier about streams, the terminal operation is the thing that defines how things actually get processed. Even though it's nice to think about the way that streams get passed from one operation to, to another, it's not actually the way things work. So even though you can put serial parallel as many times as you like in your stream definition, it's actually only going to be processed, the whole stream, either sequentially or in parallel. And basically, whichever is the last call to serial or parallel is the one that's going to win. So in this case, parallel is the last call, so the whole stream will be processed in parallel. You will not be doing your map to int in sequential mode. It's all going to happen in parallel. Once you use a parallel stream, you should be very careful about making sure that the operations that you use are very much stateless, because it's functional programming, and also independent of one another. Because if you do start to do things where there's things being modified, you can run into all sorts of problems. So how does the parallel stream work underneath? The parallel stream uses the fork join framework that was introduced in Java SE 7. And if you look at the details of the fork join framework, what you'll find is that there is a common fork join pool that is created when the JVM starts up. It does that so that when you want to use the fork join framework, the pool of threads to do that is already available. So there's little overhead in terms of using the, the fork join framework. By default, when you start up your JVM, you will get as many threads in your fork join pool as are reported by the operating system through the get runtime .available processes. Now, it's interesting because I've seen a number of different presentations on this, and some people say you actually get twice as many threads. Some people say you get as many threads as reported plus one. The answer is no, you actually get as many threads as reported by available processes. I actually went and checked the source code for this to make sure that I was right on this. So it is only the number of processes that are reported by available processes. Now, you can change that if you want. So there's a, a very easy to remember command line option, which is minus d java.util.concurrent.forkjoinpool.common.parallelism, which you can set to whatever number you want. So you can reduce it, or if you want to, you can actually increase it. So let's look at how we can use this. So we want to use parallel stream. So I'm going to set the, the parallelism in my pool to be four. Great. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the same code I had before, but this time I'm going to actually record some information about the threads that are being used. So I'll use a concurrent set. Now I know I'm strictly speaking modifying state here, but we'll just ignore that. And we'll have a look at what threads are being used in terms of processing this. So what I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to print out how many threads are being used to process my parallel stream. So let's have a show of hands. Who thinks that the answer that's going to be printed out is four? OK, this is good. Oh, oh one person didn't spot the fact that this is a trick question. Anybody think it's less than four? OK, a few people. Anybody think it's more than four? OK, a few people, OK, and a number of people who have no, no view on this. OK, well, the answer actually is five. So you think, hang on, I have set the parallelism to four. Why have I got five threads executing my code? This is not good. I said four. I want, don't want five. So let's change the code a little bit. And this time, rather than printing out the number 
of threads. Let's print out the name of those threads so we can see where they're coming from. And if we do that, what we'll see is that we've got the, the fork join pool workers, 0 to 3, so that's the four that we have specified in our parallelism. But we've also got an extra one, which is main. Now, this is the actual thread that's running the code for our stream. And the way that things work in terms of the parallel stream is that the invoking thread is executing that, is used as a worker as well. The reason for that is that fork join um, pool or fork join framework has to execute synchronously. So it pauses until all the work is done. So the people who did the streams code said, well, OK, if, we, if that thread is just going to sit there doing nothing, let's use that thread and add it to the, the pool of workers for the, the fork join pool and get it to do more work. Which is, I, I, you know, it's kind of like, OK, well, yeah, except that, you know, I actually want there to be four threads, not five. Mm, OK, well. Now, a couple of things to bear in mind about that is, one, don't nest parallel streams. Because what you'll find is that you're using the same fork join pool for those nested streams, which means that you're going to find the same threads trying to do the, the work. Now, they won't bump into each other, because they'll have different run queues and different uh, um, operations that they're going to be processing. But they will be trying to do work from different parallel streams. And you'll actually find that if you nest parallel streams, you'll get um, worse performance than if you use a parallel stream with nested serial streams. The other thing is try and avoid I.O. that might block in terms of the operations you're doing. Now, there are some things that are introduced in JDK 9 which will improve that um, around the way that um, the, the fork join framework works and all the blocking I.O. operations will be shifted to one thread. But um, still, you know, best not to do I.O. stuff within a parallel stream. Now, there's, there's also a, a, what I call a, a custom pool hack. So if you want to, if you actually want to nest parallel streams, then you can do it this way. So you can create your own fork join pool. And you can say, right, in this case, I want four threads. And then use that as a way of executing your code. Pass the stream in as, um, well, submit it to the, the executor and have it executed through the fork join pool. In this case, you'll actually find that the count is four, because you're executing it within your own fork join pool rather than using the, the um, parallel stream code underneath that, that uses the custom fork join, uh, sorry, the um, common fork join pool. So the next thing is, is a parallel stream faster? Now, most people think, oh, right, so I want things to go faster. I'll do them in parallel. Parallel is going to make it go faster because I can do multiple things at the same time. Not necessarily the case. What I will guarantee is that if you use a parallel stream, you will be doing more work. Because you have the overhead of setting up the fork join framework. You have the overhead of the necessary bits and pieces that need to go into that. So the point is that that might complete more quickly. Depending on what's going on in your code, it might finish more quickly, but it might not. So how do you know? Well, several factors affect how a parallel stream works in terms of performance. So the first thing is, how many elements are there in your stream? So you can call that n. Now, that's something that's fairly easy to measure. You can tell the size, well, quite often you can tell the size of a stream, so it's, it's easy enough to kind of measure that. But then it's how long does each element take to process? And what you need to do is you need to say, OK, the bigger that number is, where you can you multiply the number of elements by the time it takes to process each one, the bigger that number is, the better a parallel stream is going to work. But it doesn't mean that both numbers have to be big. If you think about it, if you've got eight threads available for parallel execution, and you've got eight elements in your stream, so you might think, oh, OK, that's a small number, eight elements. But if each operation takes two seconds to complete, then executing in parallel is going to be well worth doing because it'll take two seconds, well, just over two seconds to operate, versus if you do it sequentially, it's going to take 16 seconds. So it doesn't have to be both big numbers. It just has to be one or the other, and multiplying them together gives you a big number. Also, it depends on what kind of thing you're doing in your stream. So if you look at things like filter and map, these are very good for parallel operation. They decompose perfectly into parallel operations, and you can execute them without bumping into each other. Things like sort, things like distinct, because they do require um, you know, 
reference to other parts of the stream, then they won't decompose quite so well into parallel operations. You might, you know, there, there are ways of improving performance, but it's not as good as things like um, map and filter. So just to kind of um, last five minutes, just want to have a quick look at some of the things that are coming in JDK 9. Uh, I've said this lambdas and streams in JDK 9. It's actually only streams, really. A um, couple of new APIs. The optional class now has a stream method. So you can actually get a stream from your optional, which will either be zero or one element, depending on whether you have um, zero, well, a reference to an object or a null. Flat mapping is a new method in the collector's utility class. It's really just a way of combining a couple of things in order to um, create a new collector. So it's a simple way of doing things. Um, really, it's just a, a more of a utility method there. There are a number of places where you can get new stream sources from. So matcher, scanner, network interface, permission collection, all have methods now which will return a stream of objects from those things. So in the case of the scanner, you can either get the, the set of results as a stream, or you can get the individual tokens from the scanner as a stream, and you can process them as you want. Parallel support for files.lines. This is a, a nice idea, because if you use the files, um, well, if you use the buffered reader, and you're trying to process things in parallel, it's, it's not really going to work very well, because you're reading lines from the file sequentially. And if you try and pass that into a parallel stream, it's just not going to give you any benefit. What's been done in JDK 9 is say, OK, let's introduce this lines method in files, which will allow you to operate in parallel. So it takes the file, maps it into memory, and then divides it up into multiple regions based on line breaks. So you won't necessarily get exactly equal chunks of your file, depending on the length of the lines, but it will break it up into chunks so you can have those processed in parallel, and each thread can pull lines from the memory mapped area of the file independently, and it can actually improve performance. If you look at the kind of results you get from that, you'll see that uh, the left-hand side of the graph is using the buffered reader.lines method as a stream source. The blue indicates sequential, green indicates parallel, so you'll, you'll find that the green is actually worse if you try and use um, sequential or the lines from buffered reader in parallel. And then if you use files.lines, you'll see that depending on how many processes you've got, you actually get an improvement in performance. So it's probably four processes in that machine. Two other methods that are quite interesting in the stream API. Um, one is drop while. So the idea here is that what you do is you say, OK, let's take the, the stream, and then let's ignore all the elements in that stream until we see a value that meets a predicate. So in this case, we're trying to drop everything until a value is less than 56. Once the value gets to be 56, then we will start taking things from our stream and carry on. The reverse of that is take while. Take while says, OK, we're going to take elements from the input stream until we match a predicate. So until we get a value that's less than 56. Once we get a value less than 56, we stop taking things from stream, stream terminates. One thing you do need to be a little bit careful about that is dealing with an unordered stream. Because if you have an unordered stream where you're getting values which vary a lot, then you might find a situation where you get a value that's less than 56, stops taking elements from that stream, but later on, you might have other elements which were bigger than 56. But it's, it's just something to bear in mind with the way that that works. Just to conclude then, um, lambs and streams are a very powerful combination. So it's functional programming introduced to Java. Nice kind of gentle introduction to ge functional programming in Java. But it does require you to think differently. Don't think when you're doing streams about using loops. So avoid that sort of pitfall of saying, ah, yes, I want to do this for each element in my stream, where you think, for each, ah, I'll use the for each method. No. If you think you're going to use for each, stop and think, do I really want to use for each? There are certainly situations where you can use for each very legitimately. If you're printing out elements from a stream, for each is quite valid. But if you're trying to do more complex things, which should be done as a reduction, then do it using a reduction. 
Be careful with parallel streams. Don't think that by making everything parallel, it's going to run faster. Think about how the common fork join pool works. Think about things like nesting, parallel streams, all those sorts of things. Obviously, more things to come in JDK 9. There are probably more things to come in JDK 10. Um, and since I have all of 15 seconds left, I guess it might be time for one question. <laughs> Or not? I see no raised hands. Okay. Well, thank you very much.